when I was asked to, uh, to participate in this particular uh, uh, conference, uh, I mentioned that there were my basic areas of, uh, of research in the area of professional wrestling um, was fairly standardized in terms of a sociological approach. In other words, there was a macro, micro dimension, and then a time sequence uh, that attached to both. I could uh, 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 talk about the micro because I've spent the past five, six years becoming a professional wrestler, wrestling in the ring, interviewing wrestlers in both Quebec and Ontario, interviewing fans that, uh, as far as I see, is, uh, are critical uh, to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to the engagement of, of professional wrestling. And that engagement is qualitatively different from any other theatrical experience uh, because uh, as I, from my experience of entering the ring, uh, I didn't quite understand what professional wrestlers meant when they said it was in their blood. But when I entered the ring, or even before I entered the ring, as I was approaching it, I could control the crowd. Uh, and no other, and I'm not an actor. Uh, and and I, I shudder to think what it would be like to be an actor on the stage waiting for the approval right, of the, uh, the audience, hoping that I would not be booed for my bad performance. Here was an opportunity where if you're booed, you feel invigorated to be able to even go further to generate the kind of heat that, uh, that makes a professional wrestling quite interesting. So I've, I've already started, a, I've given a presentation before I've called Work, Heat, and, uh, um, and, and Selling, and that which deals at the micro level. But the challenge was to try to tackle the problem at a macro level. And I said to, to Nicola, I would like to try this, and, uh, and this is the, so far, the beginning of the end of uh, the, uh, the, the macro approach. It's, uh, it's not just with the WWE, um, but as you'll see, uh, I've combined a number of, of issues, the complexities of which uh, I'm acknowledging now. Uh, what I have done is distilled from the vast amount of uh, data that I've looked at, I've distilled what I think are the most important dimensions. But certainly, I'm positive I have not exhausted uh, all of them. And so I look forward to your input on, uh, on this continuing issue of, of the, the cross-cultural uh, persistence of professional wrestling in what I have called five territories. The five territories are Mexico, the United States, Canada, Great Britain, and Japan. Now, that's not to say that uh, there isn't a vibrant uh, independent professional wrestling federations in Germany or elsewhere in the world. It's not to say that the WWE will only go to these uh, particular countries. In fact, the WWE has never been to Mexico. Uh, so they, so they, these are complex issues and hopefully um, the distillation of which is uh, uh, make, will make some kind of sense as to why in these particular countries professional wrestling has persisted all, up to almost to at least a hundred years. Uh, no, okay, so what? I, oh, it is working. Okay. Now, before I start, uh, whenever I lecture, I always uh, kind of do a little bit of uh, fun, make fun of things, right? So, uh, this was posted in 2003. Uh, on a website uh, discussing professional wrestling. It says, making fun of professional wrestling is like shooting fish in a bucket, right? So in, in other words, one of the problems of teaching and researching in professional wrestling is that you have to put up with this, right? Okay? <laughs> Number two, so this is a real joke. No, I don't know about a real joke, but anyway. Yeah. How many wrestlers does it take to change a light bulb? What's a light bulb? <laughs> okay? So again, getting at the ideas, uh, the, the stereotypical ideas about professional wrestling and wrestlers, uh, uh, etc. And finally, uh, there's an old adage, when it comes to the world of professional wrestling, for those who enjoy it, no explanation is, uh, is needed. Well, I'll take issue with all of these, right, because I think there is a need for explanation. <laughs> but anyway. Um, now, I'm going to start with uh, a, a little story. Um, and then, then I'll uh, hopefully uh, be able to bring it all together at, uh, at the end. 
Um, um, it begins in 2002 at the uh, Yokohama Arena in, uh, in Japan. The WWE has come back to Japan after seven years of hiatus. Uh, in the mid late uh, 90s, uh, uh, they were great in Japan, but then just kind of fizzled, uh, fizzled out. But they came back in 2002. And a, the card featured uh, Chris Jericho uh, and The Rock and uh, the Dudleys versus uh, Kane and Big Show. So the end, just told you who won, who won, but it's not necessarily a big deal. The big deal is this, before the event begins, Shane McMahon comes out uh, with uh, Wally Okamuchi, who is a very well-known uh, All Japan Pro Wrestling Federation referee. And so Shane starts to speak in English, and it's Wally who's translating into Japanese. They are immediately, uh, uh, the response from the crowd is, a, is immediate booing. Huge amounts of booing. Huh? And that Shane picks up on this, kicks out Wally, and starts to speak in English, in very slow English. And with that, there's a huge crowd of, uh, of uproar, of applause, oration. Oh, they wanted, the fans wanted a genuine, what about genuine American global media product? They didn't want it Japanized. They didn't want it. They wanted to to uh, to capture this uh, experience for themselves as a genuine uh, American product. Um, interestingly enough, a few years later, WWE goes the same route as it did before. Goes down. Not too much interest in the. Uh, um, uh, anymore, not too much, meaning there are hardcore fans that are still there and they'll go, but the hardcore fans you see are you know, 8,000, 7,000 uh, people who will attend these, uh, these events. Part of the, re and, and so on the, um, in the, well, the paper is much more detailed, but uh, I'm also going to acknowledge the fact that I think it could be even more detailed, it could be three times as big and probably should be, should be kind of thing. But basically what, uh, on, a, on a blog, in uh, about 2011, 2012, uh, the, um, the, what, I, I, you have to pronounce, forgive my, my Japanese, but uh, Masarini Hari uh, are, argues that the, the one of, there are th he uh, says three reasons why basically the WWE is no longer uh, important or, or interesting. One, their ticket prices are always too expensive. That makes sense. Uh, their talent, talents aren't as great as it once was. Uh, again, probably true. But more important, uh, from my point of view, is, and he says, and young casual fans are a whimsical generation. Huh? Young casual fans. So what does that imply? Well, Sam Ford and Henry Jenkins and others kind of, especially Henry Jenkins, has talked about a group of young, relatively affluent, pe young, yeah, affluent young people uh, who are a product of globalization and who consume global media products like you wouldn't believe. And so uh, that's why in part of the title is pop cosmopolitanism. So the, the issue, oops, okay. Before I get to that, right? So the, uh, the, the issue then is to start to explain this particular gr group of young people who are global, relatively affluent, who are consuming all kinds of global media products, of which WWE is just one. And, uh, so that, that whimsical kind of generation. So that's what I think he picked up on. The, uh, but there are not, it's not just that. Right? And they, uh, that posed the problem for me. Mexico, as you, you know, uh, from yesterday, Mexico seems to be a fascinating area to, to, to look at, and of course it is. But Mexico became an outliner for me. Right? I mean, why is it that Mexico has been able to maintain its, uh, its prominence? So these became the two main issues for me, is to try to explain this group of young people who are consuming this particular media product so at a level of globalization, quite high, to Mexican lucha libre, right, which is, remains working class, remains attached to social movements, remains a very vibrant uh, culture, has its own kind of cultural product, but very, very different. So how do I explain these two very different kind of uh, experiences? So here we go, all right? So 
What I've done is I've created a concept called cultural embeddings. Uh, so, uh, to try to explain this, uh, this change. So, first of all, so while, a pop, while popular in several countries, professional wrestling maintains a lasting presence in five territories, the USA, Canada, United Kingdom, Japan, and Mexico. And what I'm using to try to explain its permanence over a long period of time is a concept called, what, that I've created called cultural embeddings. And it re refers specifically to professional wrestling. I'm not making any other pretensions, right, to that, uh, to this. But so these are the indicators of cultural embeddings. One is a continuous history of professional wrestling. Continuous history, at least for about 100 years or so, within that time frame. Now with, in that, in the, in the text, I also trace out the, the history of of uh, professional wrestling from uh, the early catch to submission wrestling to professional wrestling. But what's interesting in virtually all the main countries, except for probably Canada, and so I put Canada in because I'm a Canadian, maybe I could be convinced it shouldn't be in there, but anyway, um, uh, is that uh, the, the link with indigenous peoples, even in, in North America, uh, the, uh, the natives, uh, Native Canadians, Native Americans, if you will, uh, and that, all wrestled. And there was these, indirectly, these links to, to wrestling there. In Mexico, of course, with the Aztecs and Mayans. In Japan, with sumo. And even to a, a certain degree, there was uh, some, um, still have to feelers uh, to verify, but there is some kind of, uh, something that was going on in, in Great Britain too, Cornish, Irish. Uh, Lancashire, there are a number of areas that kind of uh, uh, intertwined that together. So this continuous history also means there is also an embedded link to a particular indigenous uh, population. Second is that uh, national television exposure during old school era, the old school era I'll talk about in a minute, uh, but the old school era lasted till about the early 90s, until the attitude period in WWE, and which I'm going to go on and even further. So in this, with television exposure in old school professional wrestling, you end up with larger than life characters. You have Hulk Hogan in, in North America, you have Big Daddy, right, in, uh, in Britain. You have El Santos, right, in, uh, in Mexico. You have also uh, Rick Dozen, and then later on, uh, other people who've become then icons in, the, uh, uh, in professional wrestling. And something that people today who've watched professional wrestling can always say, oh, I remember seeing right, Hulk Hogan versus the Ultimate Warrior. Or I saw right, you know, Big Daddy, right? Um, maybe not in this generation, of course, right? because that Big Daddy and others are not, doesn't work. But in old, for older uh, generations, it seems to, to work. So television exposure. Uh, fun, at the national level, fundamentally uh, important. Three, is a continuation of a widespread group of independent professional wrestling federations in each territory. So in the United States, in Canada, in Great Britain, in uh, Japan, and in Mexico, there are a number of, uh, of, of independent, if you will, kind of federations. The biggest one in Mexico, of course, is CMLL. And, but in Canada, there are hundreds. In the States, there's close to 1,000 independent federations. In, in the United Kingdom, there are many. Uh, and so on. So you have to have then these farm teams, if I can use kind of traditional sports, these, a lot of these independent. Uh, and then finally, there has to be some recognition of the past, uh, hence. You know. And so uh, commemorative cultural experiences, recognizing the past experiences of professional wrestlers, <coughs> and as a focal point for young and old fans. So for example, in the United States there is uh, the, uh, the Hall of Fame. Uh, that's in uh, it's in uh, upstate New York, so there's a Hall of Fame. Britain and Canada have put websites out that uh, celebrate the past histories of uh, their great stars, uh, etc. So there has to be then these three four dimensions of uh, uh, which I call then cultural embeddings to explain this persistence over a period of, uh, of time. So that's that's what I thought would be the explanation, but of course I have to come to grips with these young people who will only go to a wrestling a match or a WWE uh, event occasionally uh, to experience a, an American product. And then I have to explain Mexico. Huh? Um, and that. So what I've done in the paper is make a uh, suggestive argument and maybe one that's highly provocative. Um, and, that, and that is that I'm making an, an argument 
that globalization has had a very specific impact on global culture over a period over a, the past 20 or so odd uh, 20 to 25 uh, years and I'm linking globalization with neoliberalism uh, in North America and Britain certain degree in Germany certainly its impact on Japan but interest and one of the arguments I make interesting enough not as much in in uh, in Mexico so globalization as a world capitalist development uh, is one dimension but more important for my argument about this switch from old to new school professional wrestling is the, the, uh, the, the link with neoliberalism. And by li neoliberalism, this, I, I think everyone knows what neoliberalism is, but I'll just kind of quickly go over it, is you know, the, the rule of the marketplace that uh, basically a private enterprise can do the things that uh, better, cheaper, more efficient. It's an argument, not necessarily the reality, or the argument that cutting public expenditures for social services is good, privatization of, of state enterprises is good, uh, which means basically a decline in unions, uh, etc. And then here, the crux, eliminating at the ideological level, eliminating the concept of the public good, or at least minimizing its influence as much as possible, right, or community, right, uh, and, and replacing it with individual responsibility that it's the individual's responsibility to get a pension. It's the individual's responsibility to get a good education. It's the individual's responsibility to get a good job. Kind of thing. And that those who fail in the system have no one else to blame but themselves. You know? And this generates an attitude, uh, a general attitude amongst young people, a general attitude uh, that I'm going to argue amongst professional wrestlers because it fits within this North American, British, Japanese framework, right, of hubris and attitude. Right? So it was no accident that in the 1990s, right, when Steve Austin comes out and starts out with his uh, parade of uh, you know, beer guzzling and in, in your face kind of attitude, and it was no accident And Vince McMahon said, gone are the days of good versus evil. We're all shades of gray. And so I have to, we, ha we have to change in order to meet the times. Right? So Vince McMahon could see the writing on the wall. Uh, and what I'm arguing uh, is, is that this new male, uh, it's called new man boy, right? this new male that comes out to the floor ha has to be very different from old school, but must carry this idea of hubris and attitude with him. You know, and so it's no accident that the attitude era starts in the 1990s and continues on all the way through uh, to, to today. So that, so that's some of the well, another little, sorry. So the second part of the uh, the argument is is class relations. If class relations uh, don't change, then at the ideal, you know, sounds Marxist. Hopefully, it doesn't have to be necessarily Marxist, more materialist maybe. And, uh, but if there, if there are no substantive institutional changes in a particular country, then uh, you're not going to get a change in ideology. So there has to be a change uh, within the countries in question. So class relations here I'm targeting, only one, one example, and that is a weakening of the trade union movements in the United States, in Canada, in Great Britain, in Japan, um, and what, uh, different argument elsewhere. Right? And now what this has meant also is uh, increasing income gap you know, between the very rich and the very poor in these particular countries. And the, f the flagging influence of traditional social democratic parties and, uh, and doctrines, because if you have a weakening of unions, you have an increasing of the income gap, then by definition it seems that it, the social democratic parties uh, in Canada, for example, the NDP, you know, Others, can, they have to either disappear or their ideology has to become more consistent with the ideology of, uh, of neo, neoliberalism. So when all of these institutional factors kind of put into place, then it allows neoliberalism, it allows then the strengthening of the ideological precepts of neoliberalism, in, including greed, avarice, right? uh, including hubris, right? and including arrogance. So, and these are individuals. And you'll notice that increase, again, these are all provocative, so I'm, you'll find exceptions to all of this, right? You're increasingly in the WWE, 
It's individuals versus individuals in the ring. You don't find too many tag teams anymore, and you sure as hell will not find anything like what you find in Mexico, which is the norm in Mexico is six-man six tag teams. Right? You know, never hear that. Right? And when, in interviews, quickly aside, in interviews I've had with uh, some of my wrestlers who've gone down, not my wrestlers, wrestlers that I've interviewed who've gone down to Mexico, uh, one of the first reactions is that we just we can't stand these six-man tag teams, right? We don't understand how in the world they function. We don't know what they do. You know, why don't they do one-on-one? -on -one? Yeah. So they they they've gone down to experience it because they know it's a it's influential. But it, there's a, there's a disjunction uh, between them. Okay. So sorry. Um, so, uh, so since globalization, linking with neoliberalism, class relations, and so this. The other, make, also make the argument that there's a small group of young people who are affluent enough in Western countries, and I'll go on in a minute about that, that who want to buy a good product. Right? And one of the things about uh, professional wrestling globalization is that all the fans, you know, professional wrestlers, promoters, recognize that what they do in the ring is not only choreographed, but it's also entertainment. Right? So they got it. And what that means is that they have to create a good product. And this seems to be true regardless of the, fe of the federation. And that. So a good product normally refers to the wrestling matches themselves. Right? If you're a wrestler, that's it. But increasingly, it also means the products that are associated with it. And not just the, the t-shirts, uh, little DVDs like in Indies, but if, if you've ever been to a, even a WWE house show or any of these uh, things, there are pay-per-views, there's music, there's books, there's action figures, there's a, uh, and a variety of retailers that, uh, uh, that will, uh, will provide you with access to this. And, and, uh, so there's all these cultural products that also become more and more part of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the argument. So most of you are probably aware of this, but anyway, so that's that. So what I wanted, uh, so that's the kind of contemporary snapshot. Now what I want to do is be able to uh, try to explain the change from old school to new school professional wrestling in four of the territories, uh, not in, in Mexico. Right? So there's that. And here, go back to Roland Barth, right? Um, and that. So I'm sure you've already know this. I'll just quickly uh, scratch, uh, scratch through this, right? So uh, old school professional wrestling has a very specific set of sequences um, and in terms of its uh, storyline. But what he is able to pick up on and what DeBarso is able to pick up on is the, the intensity of the emotions that have to be generated in the, uh, um, in the relationship between the fan and the, uh, uh, and the wrestlers. And so what, what he argues is, is that uh, this is a performance of suffering. Um, and it's this is what captivates old school professional wrestling, is, is this like, exhibition of su suffering. It's not, just a, um, it's not just a spectacle. It's a spectacle of excess. Huh? And, and this excess is linked to suffering and humiliation. Huh? And so all of this has to be linked uh, together in order for the wrestling match to make sense. It makes sense because it's a morality play in old school professional wrestling. It's a morality play where eventually justice will be meted out in the ring. The ring is sacrosanct. The ring is sacred. And eventually, uh, the evil heel will get justice in the ring by the good guy. And the classic example here is, uh, is uh, Roland Barthes uh, worked with uh, a group of Quebec um, uh, filmmakers and created an NFB, a National Film Board uh, classic called Le Catch, La Lutte, uh, La Wrestling, you, know, uh, you name it. It had several subtitles. And, that in, and it was during the period of Edouard Carpentier, which was a French wrestler and who was, went to Quebec and uh, so very famous. But there were basically uh, the, the, you see, and what is communicated there is the justice is finally meted out in the ring. Uh, this is an old school pro wrestling uh, thing. So what 
Barthes is talking about in his earlier essay in 57, he carries through when he comes to Quebec and works with a film artist to create a film about what it is he is in fact talking about in this uh, essay. So it, you have to be in an environment where there is emotion re without reserve. That's why in old school professional wrestling, all the, the lights go out and the only light that's there is on the, uh, on the stage. Uh, and, and Oops, sorry. Second is that is the body of the wrestler. Right? He says, as soon as you see the wrestler, right, you know what role he's going to play, number one. Right? So it's therefore in the body of the wrestler that we find the first key to the contest. Right? Wrestlers therefore have a physique as preemptory as those of the characters of the Commedia dell'arte, right? who display in advance in their costumes and attitudes the future contents of their parts. Right? So that's, so you look second to the, to the body. Of the, uh, of, the, of the wrestler. Yeah. And to be effective, the, the wrestler's body type and attitude, and attitude, must communicate to the audience's future role. So he gives you the three examples, right? One is, uh, four examples, but it doesn't matter. Uh, Tolvain is a 50-year-old uh, asexual hideousness, right? So a really ugly guy, right, comes out. So you know he's a heel, just like that. You don't, no communication, no, not, not necessary to give you cheap heat. When he comes out, you know he's the bad guy, number one. On the other hand, you look at, uh, my pronunciation will be terrible, I'm sure, but Renier? Yeah, yeah. So he's a tall blonde, right? Tall, blonde, limp body, right? kind of thing, unkept hair, the, the moving image of passivity. Right? So you know he's going to get beaten up like hell. Right? You, know? you just know that. Right? Just immediately that's communicated to you without any uh, need for anything else. Right? So this, these images then are communicated to the body. Right? And this is important because this later get, is necessary for new school also, but in a very different kind of way. And in the wrestling hole. How do you do the exhibition of suffering? How do you do the spectacle of excesses through the wrestling, uh, wrestling hold? Right? Uh, and and it's, he says it's a ritual punishment. Right? Um, and it must communicate, the heel must communicate to the audience the slowness right, of the torture. So the wrestling holds are held for a long period of time. Not long, you know, not hours in the turn of the century, but at least maybe a minute, maybe a minute and a half, that's long, long period of time or whatever. So you've got the guy on the mat and you want, and you've got this hold on him and he has to communicate to the audience that he's suffering and he's suffering really bad. But, and then, and Bars makes it very clear, right? The audience doesn't want to see the guy really suffer. It's the iconography, right? It's the image of suffering right? that, is, that is fundamentally important. It's the play. And so that becomes then the, 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 the third element. Um, and that, so the spectator does not wish for the actual suffering of the contestant. He only enjoys the perfection of the iconography, right? So if it's really well acted, really well done, then people will go crazy, right, over it. Right? And then finally, well, this gives you some idea, right, of old school right, uh, professional wrestling matches, right? So, we, oh yeah, you can see that, right? So, you know, the, uh, Iron Sheik's camel clot. I mean, all of these are fairly, you know, famous kind of things. And what I've done in a little corner is kind of giving you little boxes too, right? So there's uh, the Piper's Pit, if you see it. So, so there's the old school kinds of stuff. So uh, all of these then, you know, and the, the display of suffering and the fact that these are long held holes then uh, communicates that, uh, that eventually the bad guy will get uh, justice served but he might win this one match. He might win two matches. He might win a whole lot of matches against jobbers. But when he comes up against Edouard Carpentier, right, there's no way in hell that he's going to lose. Right? And that, uh, that, that Edouard Carpentier is going to lose. He's going to win. But the excitement that gets generated when the evil man is able to destroy all, the, all his opposition and then comes to face right, the hero in this final gladiatorial match, then that's the, uh, the celebration of, uh, of uh, victory. That's the celebration of justice. That's what fans in old school professional wrestling wanted to see was uh, the uh, justice being served in, uh, uh, in the ring. Right? And, but in order to convince the, uh, uh, the audience that in fact this was uh, problematic, uh, that, uh, that this guy is really bad, you just don't simply end the, the match. 
You know, if you just kind of, oh, sleeper hole, bango, he's dead, right? You know, we're not dead, but you know, he's out. Right? Who cares? Right? You want to see him suffer. Huh? That's what Barth is saying. So if you want to be able to communicate the evilness of the opponent by doing these kinds of uh, actions, right? So uh, there's a, the duration of the, is the display, right? So old school professional wrestling matches, these are the kinds of things. Public humiliation, right? Well, you know, uh, uh, this becomes then the, uh, the exhibition at the end of the match, you know, to make sure that uh, the audience gets even more emotionally uh, in, invested in what goes on in the, uh, in the match. Yeah. Now, I just, I'm throwing this out because it's a little bit of micro, but in old school professional wrestling matches, for the most part, in my interviews and with uh, others, these are the five <coughs> standard stages right, of, uh, of a well-executed old uh, pro wrestling match. Uh, whether whether the face is a jobber, or whether the face is kind of the hero. First of all, the face shines, right? He has to communicate to the audience that in fact he really knows what he's doing, right? So he'll toss around the, uh, the bad guy, he'll put him on really interesting wrestling holes. You can convince us, oh, he's really scientific, he's good guy, he's no illegal measures whatsoever, right? And then the heat spot. So after a few minutes, then the, uh, the, uh, the heel will come and gouge him in the eye, right, or, or just rake his face, or do something, right, and then all of us, that's the heat spot. Then all of a sudden, you know, the face goes down, and then there's heat. Then that's when the, the, uh, the heel goes and does it, and then that's when the audience gets more and more and more upset because he is the bad guy, the heel, is eventually winning. Then uh, all of a sudden there is the comeback, and then the, the face comes back, and then what the wrestlers, or what the referees call go home, right? When you're going home, because you communicate then, the referee communicates to the, to, to the wrestler at a certain moment in time, right? Now's the time to go home. That's when the face, you know, in the end, that's when Edouard Carfonti wins the match, uh, usually with his famous submission hold or something like that, right? Or if it was Hulk Hogan, his famous wrestling, finishing hold, of course, was his leg drop, right? Of course, everybody would immediately, could be immediately pinned with a leg drop. But anyway, but so, so there would, this is the kind of standard uh, what, variations, right? but basically uh, this is the... Uh, uh. Now, the difference between, general difference between old and new school, uh, professional wrestling, I itemized it uh, here. I'm gonna have to wrap, rush through a little bit more. But basically, what I'm uh, calling um, uh, Old school professional wrestling usually has been linked with uh, the, the foreign menace, right? So usually there's race and ethnicity linked uh, to all of this uh, too. Uh, not necessarily, but very often uh, it is. Uh, usually to Cold War, because the Cold War existed. But uh, the new school professional wrestler is a narcissist, right? is a narcissistic individual, right? And my argument is, is that this kind of individual fits very neatly into a prevailing ideology of, uh, of neoliberalism. So you have to change everything about old school professional wrestling and make it new for this new generation that's been acclimatized to a new cultural environment. The old uh, theater has to change. The moral struggle no longer exists. Huh? The ring is no longer sacrosanct. Huh? The ring can no, is no longer than the, the, the shrine upon which justice is finally met. Um, scripts which are written uh, in old school to evoke emotion from the audience in terms of justice have to be rewritten, completely rewritten. Uh, the sets, you know, which were minimal uh, in either televised old professional wrestling or that, are um, yeah, now have to become elaborate. Kayfabe, which was so critical in old school, is pretty well gone uh, now, except, you know. There are always exceptions right, to, us, uh, to that. New school professional wrestling, in order for it to sound good, make its presence in uh, popular culture, is that it has to be a, like a soap opera. Right? So the scripts have to be rechanged. No longer moral, but the scripts have to be defined in terms of individualism, uh, family breakup, you know, meanness, greed. Uh, the scripts have to communicate something which, is, uh, which works with, uh, with what is uh, prevailing in, uh, um, yeah, in, dominant, uh, in dom dominant culture. And one of the dimensions is moral ambiguity. 
in, in the past there was moral certainty. One assumed that the state, for example, would come in to help if you were poor, if you're you know, suffering or whatever. Now it's your responsibility, right? So the moral ambiguity becomes then part of the general culture, becomes now part of the wrestling script. It has to become part of the wrestling script for it to be able to, be, uh, to make sense. And if, since it's entertainment, it has to have elaborate sets, it has to have music, it's got to have pyrotechnics. It's got to have everything to kind of go with the uh, go with the show. So it has to kind of uh, uh, change. So that's the m more important, right? Um, on one on a, on a different level, is the body image. Uh, that has to change. Huh? So in old school professional wrestling, as uh, as Bart mentioned, you, the body communicates immediately, right? Uh, who is the face, who is the heel, et cetera. So the Sheik or, or uh, you know, uh, Dusty Rose, the American dream. Right? He may have been the American dream in the 1960s and 70s, but he sure as heck is not the American dream to young people today. Right? I mean, if you have, this is the hero of today, no one is going to go and watch this guy wrestle. Right? So you have to change the image of what uh, the, uh, so the old, way of seeing a professional wrestler has to be completely transformed in order to make it, uh, make it work within a new generation. And so this is what he has to look like now. Right? He has to look like this. He has to look like Ted DiBiase Jr., right? He has to look like John Morrison. And you know immediately that he's got attitude. Right? This is hubris. Right? This is, you know, you know, I am who I am. Right? I may be pretty, right? and I am pretty. Right, but Ric Flair's kind of thing, right? But but even more so, all of these guys, right? You know, but I'm bloody straight, right? And I'm aggressive, and I mean, and I'm going to get into your face, you know, even as pretty as I am, right? So he's a sex object, but at the same time, has to communicate the fact that he is aggressive, fits within this kind of uh, milieu, right? So, so what I'm arguing is that when compared to most pro wrestlers of the 70s and to mid 90s, the male body image of today's pro wrestler, the heroes and villains are for the most part young, good looking, hairless and muscular. In other words, they're cookie cutters. Right? And, I'm, and I know for a fact that Vince McMahon for several years, uh, because I've interviewed a couple of guys who were in the WWE and their contract was cut and only once their contract is cut for good can you interview them. Right? So uh, I interviewed them and basically said, you know, so you know, Pat Patterson, uh, who's ironically gay, right, well, was one of the guys to make sure, right, that uh, they had to be at least six foot two, right? They had to be hairless, muscular, etc. But they had to be at least six foot two or above, right? Now, because that because they had to be a little bit bigger than life, but they had to be all look look alike. Because it would be easy, or like a cookie cutter, to easier for them to say, okay, one day your face, yay. But most of these guys want to be heels, right? And even my indie professional wrestlers want to be heels. Why? Because the ideology of the, per of the time period, it makes it easy to be a heel. Right? Because it's easier to be aggressive, to have hoovers. It's easier to have attitude, you know, to, to walk with the swagger, yeah? you know, in your, your face, right? And it becomes, so... The audience then has to be convinced of what role you have to play because if you're coming out and you look pretty, you got to, what role do you play? Whereas in old school professional wrestling, you knew that if you're pretty, you're probably the good guy. You have the face, right? hence the face. Huh? But in new school, you have to generate heat. And so very often at the local level, it's called you know, cheap heat or real heat, all this. So you have to find a way to be able to communicate uh, heat to the, uh, to the, uh, to the audience. So, uh, I'm calling this new pro wrestler a, a new man boy, right? And, and, uh, but it's not to say that there aren't these big hulks either, right? Because you have to, uh, you have to appeal to everybody, right? And, that, and so you've got then, you know, uh, Big Show, and you've got The Undertaker, you've got these, you know, also larger than life, but a lot of wrestling is also uh, these other new guys that are, that are, uh, that are there also, right? So, um, I, okay, um, I have to go to most of this, right? What I'm making an argument is, is that this happened in the 1990s, uh, this, this change, and this change in the 1990s is not, um, 
not fortuitous, it happens at the, at the right moment in, uh, in time that you have to have this new man boy and the icon of the new man boys was uh, Marky Mark Wahlberg. Right? Uh, and uh, when he came out, you know, he was a rap singer, you know, but when he came out, boy, did he have attitude. Oh, well, attitude, you know, but, you know, uh, I think I have pictures, uh, yeah. So there he is, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, there he is, right? You know, no better way, right, to communicate the, f and this is uh, for Calvin Klein, an advertisement for Calvin Klein, that Marky Mark not enjoys not only the ideal physique, but also the attitude that best matches the ideal for young urban males, and by extension, the new pro wrestler and man boy who is an aggressively self confident heterosexual, right? So this, you know, I'm in your face. So there's Marky Mark, there's John Cena, right? And there's Jim Morrison. Can you tell the difference? Right? Well, of course not. They're interchangeable. Huh? And, and so I'm, my argument is, is that once Marky Mark made it uh, that this is the way young straight guys are supposed to look like, then young straight guys who are going to go and watch professional wrestling, I'm going to watch professional wrestling for its own morality. They're going to have to watch professional wrestling with new scripts, uh, with, new, with the guys that look like the ideal of uh, this new man, um, and so on, uh, and so on. And so. Uh, then, finally, um, the wrestling ring. In old school professional wrestling, the wrestling ring was the moral center where justice struggles against evil. Yeah? In new school professional wrestling, it's lived experience where ambition destroys friendships and the moral center is absent. Okay, we're almost done. Okay, I'll, okay. So, so that's the, uh, the new school kind of stage is set. So, uh, that's why when you see any new school professional wrestling, these guys will come out on, on the ring, will be interviewed in the ring. Uh, the ring is no longer sacrosanct, right? You know, in old school professional wrestling, the interviews were always to the side, outside of the ring, kind of thing, right? And so the ring now has to have a, serve a different function, and it does serve a different function. So completely transforming the experience in order for it to fit within a new uh, environment. So how am I going to do this? What I'm going to do is, Go right to the end. <coughs> Hopefully. Oh. There, okay, sorry. All right, so in the paper, which I'm more than happy to kind of send to anybody, uh, whatever, right, is I also detail the history of uh, wrestling in the five main territories, um, including uh, Mexico. So the, the discussion revolves around coming to grips with Mexico. So in the face of globalization, in ICTs or information communication technology and neoliberalism as its ideological creed, changes have developed in many facets of our lives. You know, uh, Giddens has made reference to this, but I'll, but specifically the continuation of professional wrestling's appeal in four of the five territories is based on their specific <laughs> cultural embeddings. Huh? Uh, and I'll single out two. Right? So in the four, it makes sense. Right? Uh, you have globalization, you have then this new man boy, uh, the ring is redefined, the scripts are totally different. So all in the four territories, there is this linkage that's fairly easy to be able to make between globalization and, uh, and neoliberalism. So the, uh, the creation of the new man voice, a cultural icon, and how this hegemonic masculinity became the standard for the new school for, uh, professional wrestlers. Second, old school logics of good versus evil, where justice wins out over chicanery in the ring, replaced, is now replaced with gimmicks, props, hubris, arrogance, puerile antics of the new school professional wrestlers, attitudes mirroring many of the tenets of ne neoliberalism. To be successful in the new age of globalization, professional wrestlers, regardless of where they're located in the USA, Canada, UK, Japan, have to look and act the part. Right? So that's there. Mexico, because WWE doesn't go there, because Mex Mexico has linked itself in a very specific kind of way, you know, Mexican Lucha Libre maintains its cultural embeddings to its old school roots. It's able to withstand decide to block neoliberalism as much as possible. Uh, uh, and that. So uh, in large measure because Mexico has been as, not, has not been as extensively penetrated by globalization, information communication technology, and ne neoliberalism as a political creed. Uh, Mexico's 
you know, seldom visited, if ever, by the, the WWE. So it's able to keep itself, for, for now anyway, at, uh, at arm's, uh, arm's length. So also interesting, Mexican Lucha Libre uh, uh, outreaching to Japan, obviously the rest of Central America. So it recognizes that it has to do things to keep itself uh, going. So globalization has helped create a new group of affluent young people in the four uh, core countries or four major territories. They are keenly aware of global media products and often desire to experience the real deal, not an indigenous replacement. Uh, as pop cosmopolitans, these fickle, or what Hori calls casual fans of, whimsic of a whimsical generation, want a taste of an authentic American media product, not a Japanese uh, facsimile. Equally, there's also been what's called the hybridization. There are, you know, Pokemon and other thing, other global media products that kind of come, come this way from, uh, from Japan. Uh, but, but uh, so again, it, these are not simple, they're complicated kind of issues. So what I've tried to do is distill from a very complicated picture uh, an argument for why uh, the, why prof the experience of professional wrestling may be different in all five territories, but there are some very real similarities that link them together, and, uh, and I guess that's it. Sorry. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs>